a week ago today and acquiesced to his request that I get up in front today due to a scheduling conflict he had and I hope I will not embarrass his faith in me too much. Um, but let's start off by having a, a serious discussion. I'm going to show you a picture and in three seconds I need you to tell me what it is. All together. Ready? Six. Good. Just remember that. It'll come into play there. Um, the premise for our time here today came from the holiday season where I had a couple days off and I joined June watching some Christmas movies on the Hallmark Channel. As many of you know, the Hallmark Channel is the epicenter of Christmas movies, which June loves. I came to find out that while Christmas was definitely the theme, the real story lines were relational and were in fact a form of what we now call rom-com. Do any of you know what a rom-com is? It's a slang term for a romantic comedy, which is usually a light-hearted romance story. Now, because I'm a husband and a father, I've had to watch more than one of these type of things. <laughs> so, I have some familiarity. When you think back to your English classes and things like that, clear back in Shakespeare's time, he wrote his own comedies, utilizing a lot of the elements in the same theme. How many of you have seen or read Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice? Pride and Prejudice is an amazing relational story written in 1813. And I wish we could use it as the background for showing how our perceptions play havoc in our lives and all from our own making, but it's really a graduate level exercise. Um, I could make a much better case using this, but it shows how we sabotage our relationships and ourselves using it, but I needed a more concise example, a little simpler, so I chose Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, a modern adaptation of it. So, I have to go through this kind of fast because of our time constraints, you know. We've got to get to that other event plus the one right after this. So I'm going to be going kind of fast. Okay. There are two sisters. This is the older one, Katerina. As in the play, Katerina is the shrew. Narrate all the boys in school deem Katerina an unworthy option for dating because of her notorious assertiveness and willfulness. Her younger sister is Bianca. Their father has determined that the younger can't date until the older one does, knowing the older sister has no use for boys or romantic relationships. It's a ruse on his part so that he doesn't have to worry about his daughters and boys. That's a worthy goal I, as a father, can relate to. Now the boys in school consider Bianca very dateable. Her suitors compete with various techniques and ponder solutions that would allow her to date given her father's restrictions. This boy wants to date Bianca in the worst way, but he can't because of the father's rule. He comes from a wealthy family and comes up with a plan to take the younger sister to the prom. He bribes this guy with $300 to take Katarina to the prom. Not so much a bribe, but an expense account because of the tux rental and limo and all that stuff. What he doesn't know is that this guy already finds her refreshing and different than the other girls he has known. Now you remember, she has no time or interest in boys or relationship, so he has to work very hard to get her to say yes to going on a date of any kind. He finds her to be far different on the inside than her sharp, harsh exterior projected. It takes a lot of time and during this time, he finds out more about her. Here he has commandeered the microphone of the school stadium while she's down there doing some of her physical activities, and he sings to her. Um, but as he gets to know her more and more, he finds the inner beauty that's really there, and her pretense of a universal disdain for boys and relationships is not really who she is. And eventually, almost imperceptibly, he falls in love with her. She, of course, eventually discovers he's not like she assumed him to be either. 
He was rumored to be a bad boy in juvenile detention for a year for beating up a guy. The evidence is the year he was missing from school and the rumors that accompanied it. But through time and conversation, she comes to know that he was really just taking care of his grandfather who had had a stroke and there was no other caregiver since they were poor and his parents were dead. He admits he lets the rumor go on because it felt it was better to be known as a tough guy than a pimp. So based on her changed knowledge of him, her perception changes, and then so do her feelings. There are dozens of examples of flawed perceptions, assumptions, and misunderstandings of what we're trying to get at here. But what a sweet story, right? Of course, as all rom-coms do, there is always a fly in the ointment. She eventually finds out about the money, and no matter how she feels about him now, or what she has come to know of the kind of person he is, she can't get over the circumstances that brought them together, so she dumps him. Of course, this does not bring her happiness or resolution. She finds a sense of justice and momentary righteous anger a poor substitute for his company and care. And as rom-coms do, they eventually get through it and date or marry whatever the version of the story is. Here he buys her a guitar with the $300 that he was given to take her out. The realization I had was how hard we make our lives through our pride, prejudice, and perceptions. How they either open or close doors for us and make us succeed or fail. And how complicated we make our lives. How complicated was Joseph's life? In that story, Joseph had to be sold as a slave in Egypt to eventually become the Prime Minister of Egypt to save Egypt and Israel from a famine decades in the future. What havoc his family must have endured? What caused the brothers to act as they did to get them to sell Joseph in the first place? What obstacles Joseph had to go through just to survive in Egypt? And all to eventually bring God's purpose to fruition. We are adept in mis misunderstanding, all while thinking we're in possession of the facts. This flawed perception and misunderstanding is a crucial element in every rom-com story, but it seems like in our daily lives as well. What's more, it's been going on for as long as man has lived on earth. For a quick example, we can turn to Matthew 15. Look up Matthew 15, starting in verse 29, you can read where Jesus feeds the 4,000 after preaching and teaching most of the day. You can read about the boy with the loaves and the fishes, and near the end of the story, in verse 39, it says, After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went to the vicinity of Megadon. So that's the context of the day. And then we continue in chapter 16. The story picks up back again in verse 5. And it says, When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Again, they're pretty good about doing that. Anyway, verse 6 says, Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now what's interesting is the same event is recorded in Mark 8 where it says, And he left them, and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and the leaven of Herod. So Matthew says, Jesus said, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees, and Mark remembers it as, Take ye, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and the leaven of Herod. What they both agree on, however, is that the disciples reasoned among themselves, saying, it's because we have no bread. Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? They all discussed it, thought it over. What conclusion did they come to? Everyone agreed, Jesus has given us baking tips. Could they be more wrong? Well, we have an easier time understanding how different we humans are from God 
And God certainly knows it because he reminds us of it in Isaiah when he talks about my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. But we should be able to do better with our fellow men, our wives, and our children, shouldn't we? We're the same species. We see them every day and know them better than anyone else on the planet, right? So what can we do to have less stress in our relationships? And what part do our perceptions take in causing the problem we face? Here are six of the most common causes of marital stress. The published statistics of the six most frequent are kids, money, annoying habits, household duties, other family members, and emotional abuse. Now, I want you to look over that list, and can you name one out of these areas that is not open to perception? Stress in a marriage is part of everyday life. And why is that? Could it possibly be because we're humans and God made each one of us different? How many of the six items on the list can be exacerbated by our misunderstanding, our flawed communication, or our errant perceptions? When I took June to my 10-year class reunion, it created some stress for her. When it was over, she asked if I was embarrassed of her. I said, of course not. Why would you think that? She said it was because I didn't introduce her to many of my classmates. Now, if what she was thinking was true, Uncle Mike would have some explaining to do. <laughs> However, the truth was, and I told her this, I just couldn't remember their names. <laughs> I couldn't say, June, this is my classmate. What, what's her name again? So I followed Bambi's mother's advice and didn't say nothing at all. Now it takes me a while to remember names. It's a flaw of mine. I always remember the faces, but it takes a while after I first meet somebody to let the names sink in. So what do we do when we continually find ourselves in these type of circumstances where we assume, misjudge, or perceive incorrectly? Wrong perceptions should be subjected to truth. In Matthew 15, it takes us through some of this. In verse 17, it says, Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. These are what make a man unclean. So... Our twisted assumptions, perception, and misunderstandings pollute us. In old movies, you get the idea that a certain area or forest is, quote, evil, like evil exists in a place or a zone. Don't go over there. It's evil. But it says here, evil comes from us. Conflicts arise when two people insist on their own perception of reality, thinking they're based on the truth. In conflicts, there may be clashes of personality types between, for instance, an insecure, sensitive, melancholy who may feel manipulated by a goal-oriented choleric because of their differences of perception or worldview. Now, there isn't one perfect personality type. God has made us all different. Our perceptions tell us as much about ourselves as they do about the issue under discussion even more sometimes. Now let's look at several ways that faulty perceptions weaken us, others, or our organizations unnecessarily. First one, exaggerations. Humans are prone to exaggerate, to magnify our perception or viewpoint in order to convince people we're right. When something is bad, it's a disaster. And when it's good, it's amazing. A correct response to a given situation requires a correct evaluation of the situation itself, and exaggeration pollutes the decision-making process because it disallows a reality-based observation. We often omit considerations unfavorable to our position. We selectively direct the conversation to areas that are favorable to what pleases us. James teaches us that the source of our quarrels and conflict is our own desires 
that wage war in our members, as he calls it, in other words, in our body. We commonly think in absolute terms. Someone might say, he's impossible to work with, or everyone's against me. People are much more nuanced, based on culture, gender, age, personality, level of maturity. This one is closely related to number one on the list, exaggeration. We often misinterpret what we see or hear or experience. My reunion in June's perception is a good example. Some people take things too personally and become frustrated, upset, or angry because of small disagreement. When people take a statement too personally or interpret something as hostile, they take a tiny flame and they fan it into a fiery conflict because of a faulty perception. June and I one time took a relationship class and I learned there are people who can separate action from a person and there are those who can't. I can tell some people that was a dumb thing to do and they would say, boy it sure was, I don't know what I was thinking. And you can tell the same thing to a different person and all they hear is, he just called me dumb. <laughs> And they feel and they react on that basis, often to the detriment of their relationship and their own well-being. We should know each other well enough to be aware of these types of things. We know how to push each other those buttons, don't we? Even little kids have discovered that pouting will often get them what they want. Sometimes we react negatively to people based on bad experience from the past. Our previous hurtful encounters remind us of something that invokes a problem from the past and that conjures up bad feelings and perceptions. Paul tells us to forget the things which are behind and reach forward to what lies ahead. In the example in the Shakespeare remake, Katarina's shrewdness actually stems from a past hurtful encounter. There is a difference in thinking a person is a certain way and understanding why a person seems a certain way. Past associations can affect our opinions of others, but also our opinions of ourselves. Someone may interpret your sadness as resentment because they are resentful. Others may interpret your opposition to anger because they are angry. This is often done from an unconscious position. Um, Titus 1.5, as Jesus saying, To the pure, all things are pure. To the unclean, all things are unclean. We need to self-check our feelings and make sure they are reality-based. We often come to broad conclusions without adequate evidence. After a bad experience, we may say, I will never loan that person money again, or anyone else for that matter. From now on, everyone will have to prove their trustworthiness before I trust them. When people are armed with too many disordered perceptions, they're liable to engage in conflicts of all types. Well, what are some of those conflicts? There have been studies that show people criticize preemptively because they think people will eventually reject them. As humans, we have a general understanding that we are all different from each other, but when faulty perceptions take over, you can see people complain about others as they often attack them for merely having a different perception than they do. Some people will blame another, or the devil, or culture, or whatever they think appropriate as the time, as long as it's not themselves. If we shove the problem off to another, we will not recognize our own limited perception on the matter. Paul tells us to do all things without complaining or disputing, but be children of God above reproach, in a crooked and perverse generation, among whom we appear as lights in the world. People justify this approach by insisting, well, he wouldn't listen to me anyway. This is a cover-up for failing to obey Matthew 18, 15, where you have to talk to the other person and seek to resolve differences. We have to be careful not to impugn wrong motives to another, as this is judgment that Jesus condemns. We may insist that another person is acting out of greed, selfishness, or pride, yet we by default don't have the ability to look at the motives of the heart as the Bible says. Sometimes people think they are being used or abused or neglected. This wrong thinking can lead to distrust and hate and jealousy or benign neglect. We need to ask God to help us give people the benefit of the doubt and love them regardless of an irritation or aggravation. 
There is really no need for us to be angry when another is trying to provoke us to wrath. When I become fearful or anxious, when you're angry, it forces me to join in in adopting your grievance or problem. To weep with those who weep does not mean that I must experience your emotions as if they were my own. The best friends remain objective. Temperamental differences often lie behind wrong judgments and differences in perceptions. What is obstinacy to some is firmness of conviction to another. What is weakness to one is gentleness to another. What's illogical to one is intuition to another. Do not evaluate a person by your own standard alone or your own temperament alone. This one is rejecting the sinner instead of the sin. Opinions, actions, methods, policies, they're all open to rejection, but people are not. We need God to help us minimize the, our tendency to engage in these tactics that do so much damage to ourselves, others, and our organizations. Personality types are an indicator of our different perceptions, but there's another indicator known as thinking style. When I was involved with a SEEDS conference uh, with Russell Burrow in the church planning committee for 10 years, uh, we went to one of those, and I was introduced to a concept that was called thinking styles It basically was presented as a form or version of spiritual gifts where in a given situation each style may be the optimal optimal one for the job at hand now most people think in one way but there are basically five different styles of thinking I'm not going to go into all of them because that's a whole sermon and that's what they had basically at the seeds conference but I will tell you that each one of these thinking styles is a strength but they all come with a weakness as well. For instance, an idealist. It's a great person to cast a vision or rally people to a common cause, but they're the last ones who actually know how to accomplish it. They don't do organization, problem solving, mundane accounting. It's just a different skill set. Um, but the reason I include it here, it's important for us to know and realize that the input that they give may be the exact one that's needed in a particular situation. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. I want you to make the simple realization that sharpening, as described, is an abrasive act. It's how it's supposed to be. Um, in Ephesians 4, 25, it says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for you're all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Notice, he doesn't call anger itself a sin. It says, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. So if we were to speak truthfully to our neighbor, how much more so to our wives and children? When I was growing up, I remember an anniversary my parents had. I don't remember how old I was, but it could have been their 10th or 15th. But back in the day, I remember they could advertise cigarettes on TV. And if you're old enough, you might remember these advertisements. The thing I remember was the congratulatory anniversary card my parents received. It said, happy anniversary to a couple who would rather fight than switch. And it showed a man and a woman with black eyes hugging each other. My parents didn't let the sun go down on their anger, but what is unsaid in the text in Ephesians 4 is that to get rid of your anger, you have to process it. And if that means a spirited discussion, then that's what it takes. And I am my parents' son. June will tell you I don't let things perk and build pressure like an old boiler with a rusty pressure relief valve. I've been known to let my well-lubricated pressure relief valve go off and then I'm done with it. I think it's a form of transparency, but June has her own perceptions. <laughs> but she also has the grace to make accommodation for me. It was obviously a change for June because she grew up differently, and that's to be expected. Different humans raised her. Later, while attending that same SEEDS conference with Russell Burrow, I was in a class that defined and codified an approach I felt very familiar with. 
We don't have time to go through this whole thing because, like in the conference, it's a whole other segment on its own. But basically, this is a conceptual remake of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but specifically focusing on relationships. The foundation of any relationship is trust, and one cannot achieve this without time spent. It doesn't matter if the relationship is man, God, husband, wife, boss, employee, the operator in the same principles. It is imperative to recognize that there can be no trust without honesty. And honesty requires you to not fear the potential conflict that bringing up important issues or perceptions that may generate emotions in others. This is where you don't let the sun go down on your emotions. I think that's why Paul wrote it in Ephesians. It's level one. If you have an absence of trust, you're going nowhere. Each level makes the next level possible, and failure on a level makes the other levels near impossible. If you've grown up in a family where candid discussion or heated debate is frowned upon, guilt from even the attempt at the second level may prevent you from the higher levels and the truly fulfilling relationships God intends that we have with each other, and especially our wives, children, and fellow believers. The third level is where commitment grows and flourishes. Once that happens, all things are possible. It may sometimes look like we're fighting to some looking on because that's their perception. But we should be willing to risk it to achieve the level of honesty and trust needed to take advantage of the blessings God has planned for us in our marriages, familiar relationships, and also our brothers and sisters in the church. Those closest to us require the best relationships. And the good part is that we're always looking for more family here at Abundant Life. So I welcome each one of you here today, and I thank you for being part of my family. And when we find ourselves in a passionate discussion about some topic, I want you to know that I value you, regardless of the silly ideas you may have. <laughs> and I hope, no, I trust, that you will do me the same favor. Now back to the serious issue that we started with. You said, this was a six. But this is obviously a nine. Can we understand each other well enough to love each other and work together? I hope so. Now, let's sing our closing song. Mm -hmm.